Welcome everybody back to Siegel Talks here at the Martin Siegel um, Theater Center at the Graduate Center CUNY in Midtown Manhattan. Uh, in historic times, uh, not only the times of Corona, but it's the week before the election um, and, uh, and the entire nation uh, is uh, uh, in anticipation of what will happen. And uh, we all can explain one day why it happened and 10, 20, 30 years from now, uh, when we are in the middle of it, we are so close, it's hard to find out, to understand what's right, what's wrong and what is obvious and what was not. And um, of course, we all hope that um, people will go to vote and, uh, and vote for forms uh, of democracy, forms of art, forms of life that are good for us, for the city, for America, and also for the planet. And it's a very significant election. And, uh, and artists have been, um, of course, you know, on the forefront on this imagining of a new world, of a new a place of um, also uh, creating spaces uh, in cities so to uh, let people share worlds and to understand the other. And it is now about uh, uh, Mbe says that Achilles Mbe, we, it's no longer about, you know, that we show solidarity and we always our own group right now, what is important? How can we include what is not us and to imagine it in a good way? So many problems we has, have are a failure of imagination that people cannot imagine. Uh, 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 a present uh, you're sharing the world, the globe, uh, sharing with plants, uh, with animals, with diverse groups from everywhere, but people who are not the same as us. And we, and instead of seeing it as a as a um, as a uh, advantage, and that it makes our life richer, like music from around the world, um, we experience globally uh, a nationalism that is very dangerous. After all, I'm from Germany, and someone combined nationalism and some kind of idea of a socialism, just thinking about yourself, that was an invitation to a movement that had devastating consequences. So I, we all do think this is serious. So never, I think, the arts have been more important as places uh, to share experiences, to have an open discussion, to have an agonistic uh, a field arena, um, as Floria Malsaka told us about the world uh, of Chantal Mouffe, who says, you know, this is what theater is about. We have to create spaces where ideas can compete. There will never be an end of conflict ever. We always think one day one idea wins over the other. No, but let's play fair with rules and show what the best ways is to have less suffering in the world. And art, and especially theater, is a fantastic forum. Soon also we will have a session on political theater, documentary theater, theater of the real that deals with this much more. But to this week, again, we have the second week of the Prelude Festival, a festival the Siegel Center does since 15 years, bridging academia and professional theater and uh, New York experimental theater, theater at the forefront, young artists, emerging artists, and um, quite an amazing track record of artists who have been with us very early on. And um, again, this week it is happening, week number two online. This year, nobody would have thought of this, David, Brune and uh, Miranda Harman put it together as curators. Uh, David is with us here today. But first, we want to welcome our guest today. And as we say, this is about listening and radical listening. And I always start off with a long talk by myself, so I apologize for it. But with us today is a prelude artist, I think someone whose voice should be heard, whose voice is important and reminds us uh, what, what, what art and theater performance and music um, is all about and what it can be doing so we learn more about each other and create meaning to imagine a future um, that uh, is a better one and we need that if ever a time where we need that it is now. So we have with us a Kelsey Pyro, she's a, a Brooklyn based a black and Ojibwe artist originally from St. Paul in uh, Minnesota, music producer and vocalist for Goodbyes which is a pair contribution to Prelude. You can go to WW Prelude NYCU 2020 to see it has been fantastic contributions, small pieces, quiet pieces, reflecting pieces. I think it's a fantastic uh, lineup of, of work which tries to use the site specific and the website is the site. And, um, and uh, Kelsey um, specializes in music composition, sound art and performs her work often in, uh, in 
uh, multidisciplinary genres and uh, her experiences and stories from the African American and Native American indigenous identity, of course, within she has played with many, many significant uh, musicians and great places like the Lincoln Center uh, and, of course, also the Shed, where she did a big production. She is uh, uh, got the 2019 Brooklyn Arts Council community grants and many, many other things. David is with us here and we will talk a bit about his. Uh, engagement. He's the curator, a great curator of Prelude, a young emerging curator. We also see this Prelude Festival as a space to create new work and they all curators also have um, an open uh, invitation to create a vision uh, for um, a festival for the theater, for the world. And if it's real in the moment on that stage and that what you look at, it can be real uh, in in the real, real world, even so, of course, in the moment it is real. And so everything has consequences. And just by observing, by doing things, the world already changes. So David, welcome. Kelsey, welcome. How are you guys? Doing very well. Thank you. So I apologize for, for my um, for my uh, long introduction, but I also think perhaps people have so much on their mind. You know, you need to hear something that's not so important and distracting. And then you settle down and you open up to uh, the message that is really important. And um, Kelsey, um, so, so tell us a bit um, about, about you. Where do you come from? Well, I'm born and raised in um, the Twin Cities, which is St. Paul, Minneapolis, Minnesota. Mm -hmm. um, I moved here in 2011 and have been working uh, mostly in education with, with youth in different ways for the most part as a teaching artist and arts educator. And my cultural background is African-American and Ojibwe Native American. So African-American on my father's side and Ojibwe Native American on my mother's side. So, and how did you connect to, to, to producing art, creating music, sound? How, tell us a bit about your story. Well, I've always, my mother is an amazing woman and that she's always had me really involved in a, a lot of the arts. Minneapolis, St. Paul is a place where, you know, most people think of it as like flyover country, but really there is a huge, beautiful arts community there and a lot of free arts programming. So my mother had me in a lot of arts programming from a very young age. And I actually grew up with just my native family and um, I didn't grow up with my uh, African-American family, but my mother knew it was very important and that my reality in this country was gonna be that of, of a black woman. And so she put me in African-American dance spaces like Drill Team or the Penumbra Theater Summer Camp, which is the, um, I believe it's still the only African-American theater in the Twin Cities and maybe Minnesota as a whole. Um, and then she also had this dream that one day I would become the next Yo-Yo Ma. So <laughs> she had me take cello lessons. So she really is the one who instilled arts in me. And, and really, even though my mom's side of the family never pursued art professionally, my mom is an artist, my grandmother is an artist. My great grandfather, I know, was an artist because he made jewelry for my great grandmother. So it's it's just all been um, really embedded in it. And my mom really wanted to instill my pride in being a black woman by really infusing me into the black community as much as she could, and especially the uh, black arts community uh, in Minnesota. And from there, um, I really got into spoken word poetry and that took me a long way. So I was doing poetry and theater and music. I eventually got a full scholarship in undergrad to be a part of a hip hop arts program called First Wave in Madison, Wisconsin, the University of Wisconsin, Madison of all places. And that provided me with a lot of great opportunities and training and I got to learn how to produce and develop your own uh, shows and projects in that program. And we got to travel around throughout undergrad. And then I guess I decided I wanted a challenge and I moved to New York City with $1,000 and slept on the floor <laughs> for a month. 
um, but have finally, you know, found my way after being here about uh, nine years and really getting into the arts community here. Yeah, and so and yeah, you, and yeah, David, yes. Kelsey, I'd love for you to talk a little bit about goodbyes um, and maybe two things to think about. I'd love to hear more about how your work has taken shape since you arrived in New York, which feels very similar to my own story, although I'm not a very good artist. Um, and I'll just say something that really struck me about goodbyes and Miranda as well, my co-curator, you know, was the way it seemed to invoke all these different time scales. On the one hand, there's these very long sweeps of history. Think about the the you know the history of the Americas more broadly and the history of people from Africa in the Americas. Also your own personal history, uh, you know, the show seems derived in some part from family members, from you know, close kinship relationships. And then also um, what's, what's happened with the uprisings this summer, especially your connection to Minneapolis and St. Paul. It felt like all those were coming to bear on the work in these very interesting ways. So I'd be curious to hear you talk a little bit about more goodbyes and maybe how the last year or six months have, have shaped the work as you've, as you've put it together with your collaborator. Okay, yeah. Um... Oh, so, a lot, I know. <laughs> no, I know, but it's my last, the last six months, I mean, I'm sure for everybody has just been a whirlwind. Uh, it has been a very emotional time and a time of, time of intense growth. And uh, my collaborator, Kino Gal Galbraith, he wasn't able to make it here today. Um, he's my partner in life and he's my partner in art, which is really great. He's a Jamaican artist, Jamaican photographer, and um, I guess filmmaker now. So <clears throat> we have really, he has really supported me in many ways over the past six months. So um, Goodbyes initially started five years ago as me getting back into music production. And some of the songs were actually made on GarageBand where if you know anything about music production, it's the software that just comes with your Mac. It's not that advanced. Um, and then as I began to relearn music production and just grew and grew and grew into um, six songs, which I realized were all love songs about different African-American men in my life who are no longer in my life um, for various reasons. Two songs are about a dear friend of mine um, who passed away and was a victim of suicide, who was an artist in uh, Minneapolis, Minnesota, who touched many lives. His name is Andrew Thomas and went by Phonetic One. Some of the songs are about you know, um, my past romantic relationship where I thought that was my life partner and it turned out he wasn't. And then there's a song about my father and it's about um, the story of why he is no longer in my life, whereas he was swept up in, in the 90s, in the 80s and the 90, early 90s, um, when cocaine and, and crack hit the black community really hard all over the country. And that is how unfortunately that relationship ended with my mom and with me when I was a baby. And so these songs have been coming together for a very, very, very long time. And then when the pandemic hit, everything has just been like boom, 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 boom in my life. So the pandemic hit and it affected everybody and being here in New York, as we know, was super, super intense. The virus was new. We were all locked down and we were taking it really seriously. But then I saw, you know, people in Minnesota weren't taking it as seriously and that was really scary. And then George Floyd was murdered and there was an uprising in my hometown in one of the neighborhoods, in the neighborhood I was born and in the neighborhood where my, mo my mother was living, she's um, disabled. And so literally she's telling me they're burning everything and I'm scared and I can't go, I can't go to her. There's nothing I can do. And then, um, and then because 
you know, unfortunately people in Minnesota were not taking the virus seriously. The people that she was living with were not taking it seriously and my mother caught the coronavirus and spent um, two months in the hospital and one month in rehab. And um, that was really, really intense. And then finally in July, even though the numbers in Minnesota were going up, every all the numbers here were, you know, were going went down quite a bit. And I was like, all right, I, it's time for me. I need to go. I need to go home, and I need to see my mother because they finally were letting people come in to to see their loved ones because the doctors were realizing like that it helps people survive when your loved one can be with you. And so the doctor told me they would let me in. So I was like, all right. And my partner is amazing. He got me a flight back to Minnesota and um, I saw her and she got better in like a week of seeing me. It was crazy. But during that time I stayed in an Airbnb in South Minneapolis and I had no idea that the neighborhood I was born in a neighborhood that I've lived in and love very much was still very much a wreck. And I didn't feel comfortable take, I could have easily taken a bus from where I was living to the hospital where my mother was, but no one was wearing masks on the bus. And so I decided to walk. And on that walk happened to be um, pretty much the same stretch of where the uprising happened and literally seeing buildings that I used to go into, buildings that used to, there was a small theater. I used to break dance. That's another part of, of my artistry, but there was a small theater that used to hold like break dance practice. It was totally burnt. It was rubble. Um, and that was all very intense because no one wants to see their home ripped up like that. And, um, and it's just the fact that there are people in the world where that is, they live in spaces like that year after year who are in civil war. And that is for, for me to see that just for, a, you know, maybe it'll be like that for a year. I don't know how long it's gonna take to rebuild everything, but just the idea that that's how a lot of people live was, was really hard to see. But the beautiful thing is, like I said before, Minneapolis is so artistic. It's so full of life and a lot of people don't realize it because they think of New York or they think of LA, maybe Chicago. Um, but, you know, that's where Prince is from, you know, that's, Lizzo actually moved to Minneapolis to make her career. There's a ton of art. It's got the most theater seats next to New York. And the visual artists and arts community literally came together and started making hundreds and hundreds of murals on all of the um, plywood boards that the businesses put up to protect you know, their shops because that neighborhood is a black neighborhood. It's a Native American neighborhood and it's a Latino neighborhood. And um, there's a few white folks as well, but they're fairly new. And it kind of like reminded me, I guess, of like the Bronx in the seventies where you see like those videos of the graffiti artists like doing, like beautifying their neighborhood themselves. So even though it was really hard to see like open spaces and piles of rubble where buildings had been, there was also this resilience of the community members like taking back their community, cleaning it themselves and beautifying it in their own way and sending a message with their art. And it was really intense. And I just on those walks to and from the hospital, I just started like, taking pictures and video of everything, the good parts, the ugly parts. Um, there's some really interesting beautification. There was one where youth were literally like planting flowers in one of the buildings that were burnt down to the ground. And um, 
I just, I just love where I'm from and I love my city and I know what it's like to be black in that city and native in that city. And I've had the police called on me when I was 13, when my mom moved me into a, a white neighborhood. And, you know, there's- Why was I, the police called? Huh? Why was the police called? Oh, me and my sister who is, um, she's adopted, she's native Alaskan. We were listening to like Cindy Lauper really loud over and over again, the same song. But it was just like, we were listening to girls just want to have fun and like washing the car or something like that. So it was ridiculous. Um, but yeah, it, it's really interesting because I wasn't there, obviously. I was here in New York quarantined when the uprising happened. But there's also, you know, a lot of talk I hear from my friends that the fires weren't started from people in that community, that they were started by, you know, white protesters who really don't know how to be allies in this instance. And there's videos of like white protesters smashing in windows at the auto zone that used to be standing there that's that's not anymore and so it's very complex in that we need white allies to fight with us so we don't have to fight these battles alone and sometimes you need to mess things up so, so that you can finally be heard but then you leave a black and brown community a complete mess and we're left to to pick it up ourselves. So it's like this needed to happen. What was this the right way? Is this how it needed to happen? I don't know. I think that's an ongoing um, talk and the debate. And then a, <clears throat> then a Black Lives Matter movement was yeah. in a way hijacked, perhaps even, you know, by, you know, some, what, what, what do you say, white extremists or for whatever reason, who then also make it more about them. And then this is what became the dominant reporting about the movement. But I, I also, I mean, I, I read about the Minneapolis things and we saw it all, but I'd say I didn't fully understand that it's almost like war, like you say, so many buildings really burned and were destroyed. And uh, so tell us a bit, I, um, what were there houses or people lived in or factory buildings or what were the targets? And Most of the targets were more commercial institutions um, and some were pawn shops and like literally people had to write on the plywood boards. Like you, you'll see it in the video, like don't burn this pawn shop because people live upstairs because because kids live upstairs. And I know for a fact that um, one building was burned because they thought it was um, a condo going up. And in Minneapolis, a lot of the affordable housing programs and projects, they look like new condos, which is really good. It's cool. So one building that was burned where they thought it was a condo for wealthy people coming into the city was actual an affordable housing, you know, project that was being built. And right now, like on, on the other hand, with the pandemic, Minneapolis and St. Paul is starting to look a lot like LA, where a lot of the homeless um, people are living in tents outside. And so that is also really, really, really in intense to see because of the pandemic, there's not as much space in the shelters. And so you have parks, there are areas that it's designated or people have no choice to, to set up camp and to camp out. And so it, it, is, it is really rough um, to, to witness that right now. And a lot of my friends who do social justice work are like, you know, what's gonna happen? Cause it's already snowed there. Mm -hmm. It's you so know? cold, yeah. So it's not like here and it's not like LA. So I'm really praying for my 
hometown right now. And I hope that um, goodbyes, <clears throat> which mixes um, my personal loss with black men that I love amongst what's happening now currently um, with the Black Lives Matter movement. I hope that, you know, it at least might bring a little attention to what is still going on in my hometown because it's not over just because um, those officers were uh, arrested and charged. It hasn't gone away. It's still there. Kelsey, I have a question, you know, and one, thank you for sharing your story. And um, I'm also sorry to go on mute. I have construction outside and I don't want to interrupt. Um, but when you were filming, did you imagine that this would become, you know, a kind of um, work its way into your, into your art? Um, obviously, a lot of us will film and do things now because we have the access to, or did that impulse come later? I mean, um, and maybe one version of asking this question is, was, was, you, was your art a way to kind of uh, process and think through and maybe even find some uh, healing in the moment? Or how, how did that, how'd that interaction happen? I mean, I think because <clears throat> some of these pieces started so long ago, it's kind of come to be over a long like a period of time. And just the music has had so many different names itself <laughs> as it was coming together. And um, at first it just started out like, I'm gonna make an EP. And then it was like, oh, these songs are all about the same theme and let's process that. And then I thought it might be cool to work with Kino again because we worked at on the same piece at the shed. He did some film for that piece. So I asked him if he'd be interested in doing some more like experimental film work around how he felt when he heard the music. And he said, yes. And then the whole project was like paused uh, when my mom got, got sick. So initially before she got sick and before the pandemic, I had a whole bunch of plans on how I wanted like the film portion to come to light. But then when the pandemic hit, we had to change everything because I wanted to work with like dancers or actors and not really be in it myself. Um, and then it's like, oh, if we do it, we have to be in it, we have to, change we have to film some of this inside my studio apartment and so it kind of allowed us to be a little bit more creative and Kino who is really does not like to be on camera took a risk <laughs> and is in two of the videos <laughs> to be a part of it so that we we're able to make it like the film safely and like social distance even with the other two actors that we did end up um, working with it was like how do we do this and be safe and um, then when I saw I was sent the opportunity for the prelude festival and I already had all of the photos and images from my trip back home in July and I applied to the prelude festival during my second trip home in August and I knew that what me and Kino had was already 30 minutes long and then I realized that what we made you know connects the personal can also connect to the universal issue of what I was feeling of when I was making this work about losing these beautiful beloved black men in my personal life and what me and Kino were feeling and what I feel like probably most or all of Black America was feeling in losing George Floyd and Ahmaud Aubrey and Breonna Taylor and um, everybody else. And so it just felt like it made, it made sense to use all those photos and videos that I took as a whim um, to use them in this way to make that connection. So from 2015 
<laughs> to today. <laughs> and uh, and how do you how are you thinking about? Um, I mean, music just seems so central to your work. It was one of the things that Ren, I love. I, I love the sound. Um, you know, I spend a lot of time in your sound lab. But how have you thought about over the years, and then maybe since the pandemic, incorporating media and performance, and even you know things that are um, theatrical acting, you know, stage design, things like that. How do you think about your work as performance? And do you think that will change going forward? Or um, are you still excited about the possibility of, you know, live multimedia performance? Oh, yeah, I'm still excited about that, definitely. Um, my artistic training in first wave and undergrad and the theater and everything that I was thrown into um, growing up is has made me into a very like multimedia kind of performance artist. Um, so I'm excited to uh, start doing that again in person. And I'm also interested in figuring out how to do that virtually now because that is now a really big deal. And at the beginning of the pandemic, I actually bought the gear needed to be able to, to perform virtually. But with everything that happened in my personal life, I haven't really been able to have the space to learn all of the tech to be able to do that. But now that my mother is in like a much better place, I'm hoping that I can get, get into that and start learning how people do performance um, in a virtual space um, as well as a live space. Mm. Um, <clears throat> Kelsey, you said, I, I grew up in Minneapolis. I know what it means to be black, um, but you chose to be an artist. Um, tell us about that experience growing up also as an artist and compared to you know your friends others what up is there how, how did that work and also why do you make art what what do you think is uh, so essential for you that you say I'm going to do this as a reaction to the world around me Um, well, again, I feel like growing up in Minneapolis, there's just so much art and my mom just made it a big part of my life, which is really amazing. And so I was always involved in something artistic, if it was dance, if it was music, if it was visual art, if it was theater. And, and because also my whole family is also very artistic, it just felt really natural to me it just is, it's fun to me. It's something I can't help but do. And I feel like my art is, especially in recent years, like sometimes I make things just to be silly or to relax, but a lot of my bigger projects in recent years have been a way for me to express who I am and my cultural identity and also a form of release or therapy. I feel like I'm a kind of person where I don't speak much outwardly about my emotions. I'm usually pretty bubbly and happy, but then sometimes I keep it inside. So I feel like a lot of my art is a way for me to express what I'm saying in a different way where I feel more comfortable. And um, I also am really into doing things that women are the minority in. So I got into break dance because I'm like, I want to be one of the few women who can spin on their head. <laughs> and, and being in a space, that kind of space, and I love challenging spaces like that. And it's the same thing with audio engineering and music production. Whereas like me and my friends uh, in high school, my high school actually had a music studio in it. It had a lot of great arts programming. And me and my friends were some of the few girls in that space. And there's something thrilling I like about it. And I'm sure they like it too, which is I'm here. I am I can learn these programs as well as any other guy. And I'm going to make cool stuff. And so a lot of my practice comes from like that idea of just because I'm a woman, I'm not a cis male, doesn't mean I can't do these things and challenge myself in that way. <clears throat> and then 
learning music production just led to me recording my own poetry and my own story and putting out my own music. And I feel like I make art because because I have to. And even now more recently with my project at the shed during my 2018, 2019 artist residency, the project was called Makadu Yasikwe, which is an Ojibwe word that translates um, as a black woman, a woman of African descent. So when I got that project, I realized that through music production, I could learn traditional music from my Ojibwe background and incorporate it with R&B and hip hop and black music genres because I had empowered myself to become a music producer. And then I realized like, hey, there's a lot of stories about what it means to be mixed with black and white or mixed with uh, native and white, but there's not a lot of stories about what it's like to be native and black and all of the rich history of um, Native Americans and Black Americans in this country. Some of it's good and some of it's bad, but it's not really out there. So then my art became a tool to really push that narrative. Mm -hmm. And how was it in comparison from the sound studio in your high school and then you're at the shed, which is this is big, new, New York. And so tell us a bit, how did you experience that moment at the shed? That was an insane opportunity. Um, I'm very thankful for it, but I've never worked harder in my entire life because I had a full-time job and was trying to deliver this show. Um, it was a nine month residency um, and the show Makadu Yas Ikwe was a performance piece that incorporated uh, music and oral tradition and was a commentary on the Eurocentricity of the five stages of grief. So the entire narrative was about loss in the black community and the Native American community and how it is impossible for us to get to the final stage of acceptance because we're as an oppressed people, we're so resilient, but it's just not that linear for us as a people that there, and that there's different ways of healing than just going through these cycle of stages as prescribed. And so in the final performance, it did um, a four show run during a week in June. 2019 and I worked with a whole bunch of amazing friends and collaborators and all of the music was a mix of electronic music and live musicians. So I worked with um, my friend who was a drummer and audio engineer, his name was Compton Timberwolf. Um, and I worked with my other amazing friend who I've known since undergrad, his name is Ben Hoffman. He primarily plays piano, but he also does vocals and drums. He's, and he's, they're both geniuses in their own right. And so I played the music with them and then projected on the screen in the background was Kino's work. So what me and Kino did was we traveled to um, Minneapolis, Minnesota, and we shot in the black community. And then we traveled uh, what we call in Minnesota up North. So by the Canadian border, um, to the native reservation that my family is affiliated with, the Fond du Lac Band of, Ch of Chippewa Native Americans. And we met with my aunties and we filmed in that area as well. And so all of these elements came together to create like a, a very, I guess, multimedia, um, production and it, it was it was it was really fun and it was really crazy we had to do all the set design ourselves um, and so I had a pizza night and I was like I've got pizza and beer come to this warehouse and paint these long strips of paper um, with these basically slurs that mixed people are called like red boned, high yellow, or colloquialism, not really slurs, um, Indian hair, 
things like that with the different colors of um, um, that are attributed attributed to um, both being African American and the medicine wheel of being Native American, which is red, yellow, white, black, and then um, also green. You said you had to do it by yourself. Did the shed, do you feel that they supported it? It was possible to do within the um, framework what you got, what you wanted to do? Yeah, I mean, we were definitely the first year that, you know, they had done this, they're brand new. And of course, there's, it's the first year, everybody's learning, there's going to be bumps along the way. But what I really appreciated with them is they're very responsive. We did a few studio visits, I could meet whenever I felt like I needed. And then um, after the first year was done, they um, took a few of us out a couple of times to really get some feedback about our experience. I really appreciated that. Mm. I heard that they had they forgot dressing rooms. Is that true? In that that it's um, oh, I had a dressing room. I had, had two rooms. It worked out at the beginning that artists couldn't couldn't find their way around yet, and they had to use you know the bathrooms and things. So, um, but I mean, as you said, maybe it wasn't the very um, very beginning. Yeah. Well, I do know like I kept my production my cast very small. Like they gave me a good amount of money, but I knew it was going to be a lot of work and I wanted to make sure everybody was paid very fairly. And so I had, a, you know, two musicians. I had a friend, very type A to help me with admin and I had Kino doing the film and then everybody else who, who helped out with the set was like volunteer, like beer and pizza but I wanted to make sure everybody was fed and paid fairly. So it, I really did not have a big crew. Some people had like dancers and, or their space was outside. Not everybody was in the same space. So mine was just like real small. Kelsey, I'm curious building on this, your experience, this shed, I wanna ask you maybe more broadly about your relationship to institutions and what it's like being an artist. I know for my peers um, in the profession, you know, some of them have been, have felt very supported. Uh, Miranda and I often talk about Soho Rep, which is a, for people who don't know, a theater in downtown New York that recently put several, I think it was eight artists on their payroll and healthcare. Other of my friends are extremely disappointed by, let's say Broadway or other institutions that have seemed to have done nothing, either in the form of programming or in reaching out to artists. Uh, Roger Fe Feather Kelly, who's a great choreographer, wrote a piece about this actually early in the pandemic. Um, and so my question is along the lines of, what would you like to hear from an institution? Um, if they asked you, it could be The Shed, it could be anyone else. I mean, if they said, you know, what do you need in this time? Um, wh what could we do um, for artists such as yourself? What do you think you would say? I mean, people need like so much right now. And that, you know, I mean, I feel like I really just started working with institutions in this way outside of university in the past few years. Like when I first got a community arts council with the Brooklyn Arts, uh, for the Brooklyn Arts Council Community Arts Grant. Um, but as an artist, I've also gotten rejected a ton. And I've been told that even though I pitched this, these project of, hey, I want to push the African-American, Native American native narrative, that my work or is not, that's not what they're looking for. Um, I wish institutions would just take more risks and say yes a lot more and really do what they can during this time to to help artists that they say that they serve but it is really hard to say uh, because everybody even these institutions i know are losing funding right now but i guess If they could 
perhaps try to bend more with the times like the Prelude Festival has done and to keep going as much as they possibly can with their programming to hire artists and to be innovative with how they can keep putting on productions safely. Um, that's a hard question to answer. I know I've, you know, lost, lost work, definitely. As a teaching artist, I lost most and then all of my work. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know. I hope that they could do what they what they can as much as they can. Now, thank you for sharing. I mean, I, I don't think there's any easy answer for sure. As you said, there's multiple things. I mean, um, to some extent, there are days, you know, just to share a little bit, there are days when I feel like they should just all band together and figure out how to give people health care and, and not even worry about the programming. I mean, I'm glad what we're doing at Prelude. I'm, I'm proud of it. I'm thrilled to have you in the festival among everyone else. But then there are times when I'm like, okay, maybe we can just turn this into one large mutual aid sector. Um, but I also know there's a you know, people are making interesting work and every institution is so different having worked at others. Um, but I think what I've gathered, I think some of my peers have gathered is that it has become more clear who means their rhetoric when they say we serve this community, including artists, and for whom that rhetoric might be a cover for a, you know, other kind of corporate project. <laughs> um, but as you said, uh, there's no easy answer. And thank you for what you said about Prelude. Um, you know, for people listening at home, we're, we're trying, we're certainly not the shed, but um, it's thrilling to, to offer some, some opportunity and space and a little bit of resources for, for artists such as yourself. Yeah, I, I definitely appreciate it. And even though Prelude is not the shed, I, I love it because I feel like I can really get funky and take risks and see a lot of cool work um, because Prelude is just like, you know, do your thing and and submit it to us and you know there's not a lot of yeah we need to see this we need to come and make sure you know it is a lot of trust and i appreciate it well you gained Brandon my trust i think immediately when i heard the, the the video and heard the music come on i was like yes this is this wants to be a part of it and i i loved in the sample you sent um you know it was a video of of a, a young black man hanging out i mean just just kind of, there was a certain joy and just being with someone with the, you know, as you as the viewer kind of as the camera and the music helping you be a part of the, of the scene. And Miranda and I feel like to some extent there, there can be a revolution in just being with people and just taking the time um, and walk as, I mean, I was so inspired when you were talking about the story of just walking the street, you know, and um, uh, capturing what, what you felt was important to, to hold with the camera and, and hold inside of yourself. And that to me can be as much a re revolutionary activity as, you know, any kind of other thing we might think about under the rubric of protest or direct action, but people taking care of each other is to me, you know, as much of an insurgent activity as, and it's uneven, of course, for people in your community, um, there's so many more obstacles and struggles than perhaps someone who inhabit certain vectors of privilege, but that was what struck me about the sample you sent uh, in tandem with the language you had about it in your larger project. But um, immediately I knew I wanted to spend more time with this, so. Thank you so much. Yeah, I, yes, I, I agree with a lot that you said, like hanging out and taking care of each other is an act of protest. And like that resonates with me even more now because as soon as my mom got sick and I knew I would have to go and take care of her, as much as I wanted to be on the streets and protest, you know, I knew that what is most important is that I use, you know, taking care of people and self-care as, as protest because I want to make sure that I'm not bringing this virus with me into the hospital around vulnerable people. And then I also rent um, from, um, a really amazing 91 year old woman. And so I also knew that as much as I, I protested a little bit, but then when she moved back into the house with me, I knew it was most important for me is to make sure that I keep her safe 
because I saw what the virus did to my mother and I do not want to witness that again with anybody else close to me. And then basically this piece became my protest in the art. Wow, so that, that is so that is great. It is a, a protest piece, a piece of um, the pandemic of the time of Corona, um, you know, archiving the moment and, uh, and uh, you know, just putting it out there and uh, as an exploration, but not as an explanation. So it's, it's a, an important, really, uh, um, um, artistic uttering of, of, of you. So really, thank you for being there. How is the situation? I mean, I know you must be connected to the Black community, Black women, in the, the Indigenous community. How is the mood? What are people thinking about? Um, are they doing work? Um, what's on their mind of your friends? Um. I mean, I know they're always doing work. They were doing work before, they're doing work during, and they're doing work after. And they have amazing friends who do amazing programming there. And I'm so proud of them and everything that, that they do. Um, and it's the, the, the fight is not done yet. It's not gonna be done for a very long time because that unfortunately is how this country was built. It was built on you know, mass genocide and slavery. And so it's going to take a lot to be able to heal. And, and really this country needs to step up and admit what the heck they did, you know, and until the leaders of that country do that work. We as a people have a lot of work to do to make them do that work. So it's going to be a long time coming, but I'm very proud of them. And um, they're, they're just so amazing. And they not only supported themselves, their families, the entire community um, but then in my time of extreme need, like they were there for me the entire time. I've been going back and forth um, mm. to Minnesota with my mom. So I, I love them dearly. They're my family. Mm. We, we had also spider women um, on here um, and Native American uh, uh, artists from Canada. So how is it when you go back to the, as you said, the reservation, because we don't know, we don't hear enough about it. It's also uh, at the moment, as I hear, it's, uh, it's also a devastating moment. So what, what, what do you hear? What do you see when you said you went there? How is the mood? Um... Well, I wasn't able to go this year um, because of the pandemic, but I try to go every year. Um, and every reservation is very different. Um, so I can't speak to, to every reservation. Yeah. Um, and I actually can't speak to the reservation that my family's affiliated with, um, too much at the moment, but I do know that, um, because I have spoken with them, um, um, in order to support, uh, my mom, because my mom receives resources from, from the Fond du Lac uh, reservation and I, they are doing everything in their power to use their resources to support um, to support the tribal members. That's great that your mom had such a recovery even after such a devastating period of illness. Um, how is she doing if you can if you are willing to say of course you don't have to oh, she's doing so much better great she's doing so much better and um, she's still on like oxygen. Um, she's going to be healing for a very long time, a very long time. Um, but um, I found her a really amazing um, one bedroom apartment in an assisted living. So because it was very important to her when I first went to see her, she told me not to move back from New York. She wants me to keep um, her and my grandmother. They're very adamant about me. Uh, going after my dreams 
I go back very often. And, but my, it was important for my mom to feel independent. So she's able to heal and the space around her looks like a regular apartment and feel independent. And it's just amazing how the first week I went back in July, she was on, to give you context, she's on like five liters of oxygen right now. When I saw her, she was on 50 liters of oxygen. And in that week of spending time with me, finally having someone be close to her and touch her and be near her, her oxygen levels dropped from 50 liters down to 10 liters and she was able to go to rehab and leave the hospital. So being with your loved ones is so, so powerful. And that connection is, is so, so important. That's great. Well, I'll be thinking about her uh, throughout the week as I watch the piece as well. Um, maybe as we're closing down here a little bit, I'd be curious to hear what has been inspiring you recently. Maybe it's a long time favorite. Maybe it's something you've seen online or a performance. Um, I'll just say when I heard your cover of um, uh, So Much Things to Say Right Now, I had to go back to the Lauryn Hill Unplugged album, which is one of my favorites. Uh, I just found it at the right time and place in my life, but I'd be curious to hear, you know, what 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 has been inspiring you if any if anything um i think like right now an artist that i'm really into um is sev delisa and um she's um a really cool artist and um she's a vocalist and musician and um i don't want to butcher where she's from but I know her roots are from the Middle East. Ah, she's a Dutch Iranian singer songwriter. And her last project like really mixes like the traditional like uh, Iranian sound with electronic music. And it's so cool because I feel like that's what I was trying to do with the um, relearning the Ojibwe music and then mixing it with the electronic hip-hop and r&b music so she's she's pretty amazing yeah wonderful so and um so yeah so i hope everybody will comment and uh and tune in for your for your show on prelude and um you know for the goodbyes and um when is it exactly maybe david you repeat it it's on thursday the 29th at 8 p.m so you can check it out at uh, prelude nyc2020.com it'll be there make sure you have a good pair of speakers when you listen don't listen to it on your little mac <laughs> speakers you know put your headphones on or something else and turn it up loud so it's going to be 30 minutes or how much how long it will be uh, 47 minutes 47 minutes yeah it's a, something truly extraordinary and as always prelude it is free and open which is incredible um uh, as a festival it's the only festival also in new york dedicated to work of artists and ensembles from New York City, show work and uh, process and development, but also to talk about it, to make here business works of art, their philosophies, their ways of thinking, their, you know, instead of writing an editorial for the Times or doing a painting or a sculpture or writing in uh, a political speech, artists uh, create work and it is as significant and as serious and her anticipation also of earlier works of, of loss, uh, of mourning, of, of bodies, you know, black man, which is so central, we really have to um, take that serious and we have to see how do we, can we share that experience and also that we should take note of that. That is uh, something that um, is so existential for her and that we also should engage in a way she is with that, but also by some people in our lives with us, but especially also from the community. And I would like to everybody also remember, she is a black artist, indigenous artist, she's a woman, you know, and now also a musician who had no place to perform at the moment in New York City, any street cafe where like people are out with their guitars and listen, play for 20 people. These are the largest concerts that are going on in New York City at the moment. There used to be Madison Square Garden. There are no jobs out there. So what you do against all odds uh, is astonishing and that you uh, produce the work, um, that you put it out and it's a very important a contribution, I think, uh, for us to understand the world and to find meaning and also what art can do and to 
when we listen to the songs on Thursday um, at eight, um, you know, to really f spend time um, with you and your thinking and your mind is an extension of your thinking, your dreams, your brain. So we feel you and, uh, and this is what art does. And that's why we need art to imagine a better world as you do, because in the loss, it's also the longing for, for change and, uh, and um, to take care of what we have and what we also can lose. So it's uh, truly um, extraordinary. And um, thank you, you know, for, for joining. David, also it's so great that you, that you made it. You will also be here with us tomorrow and hopefully on Thursday and uh, where we will continue with this. And it's also a snapshot next to Pride and Everything. These are New York artists, emerging artists, one of those very, very, very difficult circumstances compared to other countries in the world make art. And this is what they do. And this is what is on their mind. So it's something very important and significant. And I hope um, we uh, got the uh, message out also for you, the viewer, that after all, this is really about you who listen now at, at home at their computers, you know, how can this affect you? And how can you do your research about your loss? And how do we can it perhaps also put in a form and to learn from it that such things change, as Kelsey said, um, we have to acknowledge what happened in this country and uh, we can only go really forward if there's some atonement for, for things that have been brutal. So um, uh, thank you for sharing. Thanks for HowlRound for hosting us, David and Miranda, you know, thanks for putting this uh, festival together to be the curators of this in this very difficult moment and looking at also online and the idea that this is site specific, web website specific, it's a great one. And we have, you know, because of that, we have a Kelsey with us. And Kelsey, again, thank you. Congratulations on everything you do. And we, you know, your journey and your work. And this is also in the very beginning, Spider Women and Muriel said, the time right now is a, an indigenous thinking also. It's the beginning of a creational myth. We are in a new time. Something has ended. This is a creational myth. And we do not know how it will end. You know, we are the heroes in a way. And we really have to take this series we have to change and um, for, for survival. And as Bruno Latour has said, and Frédéric Atuitui, who were here, on, this is a general rehearsal, this pandemic. Um, for That's what's coming in ecological disasters and uh, or perhaps also political uh, complications. It could be very little, but it's not. We have to do that right. We have to learn. We have to change. We have to take that serious. There will not be perhaps another general rehearsal with all the uh, resources we have now as little as they are so this is of utmost significance and artists have been always on that side of change and to point to what's right and uh, and just and also truthful so really thank you all and um i hope you all will stay tuned of overall stay safe encourage everybody to vote who you know to vote for you if you can't and uh, we hope uh, next week will bring a change we all need Bye-bye. Thank you. And thank Bye. you. Thank, thank you, you for watching the Ankino's piece. Thank Definitely. you. Definitely.